Um, when is it that you opened up about the, the events that happened in your life? So when I first told anyone was on the day that I planned to take my own life and I was just 16. Uh, and following the sexual abuse that ended when I was around 12 or 13, my stepdad began to physically abuse me and emotionally abuse me. And it took me into like a dark spiral where I felt trapped. And with the shame of the sexual abuse and the fear that I had, for, I mean, for him hurting me, um, yeah, I was trapped and I was stuck in, in that situation. So the only way out for me felt like suicide. I felt like that was the only option I had. Um, you know, when I reflect back, you know, as an adult, I can see other options there, but that's the thing when you have, you know, when you're in depression or in that dark space, you don't see the other ways out. And it's very easy for someone to sit and reflect now and say, you could have done, oh, why don't you just speak to someone at school? Or why don't you just, you know, it's not like that for people who are in that space. Um, so I first told someone over the phone, I was about to end my own life. I'd planned it all out. I'd written suicide letters for my mom, for my family. Um, and I stood in the bathroom ready to do it. And then my phone rang. So I answered and it was a friend and um, it just came out. It's like, I didn't have any control. It's like in that moment, I was just in some sort of panic. And I just said like, oh, this has happened to me when I was younger. Just blurted it all out. Um, and then I made a plan to sort of go to the police station. So I was supposed to be at work later that day, but my abuser always took me to work. So I knew I'd have to get in the car with him. And it was hard for me in that moment or, or that time for me to keep that feeling in because of how crazy that day felt. Um, and so I got out of the bathroom after I'd revealed this and got ready for work as normal. And then I was like, went downstairs, got in the car with him and I, I was just silent. And I remember he said to, he was quite aggressive with me that day and he was kind of saying that I seem really sad and down and I need to start lifting up because my mum's going to start becoming suspicious about things. And I was, you know, just it just made me more and more mm -hmm. sort of down and all riled up kind of. Um, and he just kept going. I remember it felt like the longest drive ever. It was only a two minute drive from my house that where I worked. Um, and he's just sort of like drilling that into me you need to just like he always did you need to pick up your mum's going to start getting suspicious about things she's going to start asking questions why is ryan so sad why is he not going to hear you now and all this sort of stuff um and then we pulled up outside and i said i just said to him like oh i'm not going to keep your secret anymore and it's the first time that i'd ever said your secret and it's also the first time that i'd ever spoke about what had happened to him directly in a way that wasn't we had like sort of code names and things like that for it, but I just came out with it there and then like, I'm not gonna keep your secret anymore. And I remember he said like, stop it with this attitude, Ryan. And he like went red and he was like really angry. Um, and so I opened the door and managed to get out and he tried to grab my top and pull me back in the car, but I managed to shrug him off. And I shut the door and walked towards and I could just see him in the background going like, it's like, get here now, type thing. Um, and that's the last time I ever saw him. Uh, and then I went into the, it was a McDonald's where I worked and I went into the toilet and I just started crying. But it wasn't for the reasons that you would think. I felt bad for him, which is, this is what will confuse a lot of people watching. And this is one of the messages that I stress a lot and I will get into it more. I felt guilty for him and I felt so sorry for him because he was my dad, you know, even though he was my stepdad, he'd been my dad since so young that, that attachment was there and I and that relationship doesn't go away just because of what he did at that time obviously as I got older and I understood abusive um tactics and how these people worm the way into families and do this it's easier to detach from those emotions but in that I was so sad that I was losing my dad and that he was going to go to prison potentially so after that, after I broke down in the toilet, I walked around and there was a police station just next door to where I worked, which is <laughs> ideal, isn't it? But mm. I just walked into there um, and then a police officer greeted me and the first thing they said to me was, you might have to come back tomorrow because we, we don't have enough officers in today or something like that, or all the correct officers. And I was kind of like, what? Like, I know for a fact, due to some of the events that had happened and the type of person that I knew he was and that you'll learn that he was, that if I would have gone back that day, I would have been murdered. Like, there's no doubt in my mind, he was in a state there where he would protect, he would have protected himself over anything. Mm. And I knew how violent he was and how he didn't show any empathy for me as a young child throughout the, all those years. 
I knew he would be capable of that. And I said that to her and it was kind of like, well, it was a guy actually. And he was kind of sort of took back and he was like, didn't know oh, what to do. All right then. Yeah. I'm going to have to find someone. So then these two other officers, which were amazing, came down and just got me into this room and just asked me like, well, what's the allegation that you're making? And it was so hard for me to get it out of my mouth. Like, oh, sexual abuse like I didn't really know like sexual abuse I think mm. and there was like oh um all right then and then they took me to a specialist center and I did a four-hour recorded interview detailing in deep depth everything that had happened that I could remember uh, which was quite traumatic within itself all of that happening in one day and this is one of the issues with you know the justice system for survivors but yeah, that was an experience just to a complete stranger explaining my deepest, yeah. you know, darkest secret that brought up so much shame and anxiety and guilt and all of those things. And then I remember the two officers that originally spoke to me came back in and they said, oh, we're going to arrest him now. And like that feeling was like, oh no, it's like, it's it's actually over. Like it is over, I've done it, I've managed to break out. And I remember there was a bit of uplift there mm. and I was kind of like, you know, things might be all right here, which was so different to earlier in the day where I was like, this is my last day on earth. Yeah. So it was such a like day of like, that day was traumatic within itself despite the experiences. But um, yeah, they went to arrest him and I didn't see what happened from here, but from what my mum told me, um, the police knocked on the door and they asked for Andrew, Andrew that's his name. And then um, uh, they came inside and they said, um, we've had an allegation of sexual abuse against you, um, so we're going to have to arrest you. And read his rights and all that stuff. And he was like kicking off and getting high rate and stuff. And he was like trying to be a bit cocky with the police officers. Were you still at the police station at this point? Yeah, I was still sort of doing my interview and then finishing it off um, and that sort of thing as this was happening at the same time. So um, he was like being cocky with the police officers and he said, oh, I need a jumper. It's too cold. I need a jumper. So there was like, oh, okay, go and grab a jumper. And then apparently he was just like on purpose, like taking his time and like just taking the mess out of him a little bit. Mm. So I think my mum thinks that one of the police officers got a bit agitated and then said to her, it's Ryan that's made the allegation. It's your son, Ryan, that's made this allegation. And um, my mum just went crazy then at him and just started screaming at him. Because that's the first time she's heard it. Yeah. She, she, you know, I'd, I'd never mentioned anything to her. Do, so, do, you never, do you think that she ever had any idea at all? This is like another big question that I get. And it's hard because the thing is with abusers is they groom the family, sure. the child and the community. And that's what I think people struggle to understand as well who haven't seen it happen in front of them. Mm. I think my mum was very vulnerable when they met. We came from quite a deprived background. Um, we lived in Highfields, which is a deprived area of Doncaster. And like, I have memories of, you know, we got kicked out of our house because mum couldn't afford to pay. This was before we met my stepdad, before I was eight. Um, you know, so she was very vulnerable and she started going to the church where we met him, I think for a sense of community. And people like my stepdad abusers, they look for them vulnerable parents. It's like the whole procedure that they do. It's like they look for a vulnerable parent with kids. Um, so it's hard to say if she if she would have, I don't think she would have known because I think my mum would have always come in and, and stopped that happening, of course. And I just think she was vulnerable and she didn't know the signs and she didn't, she wasn't educated on the issue and that's what empowers me today. Sure. Because I know my mum's a lovely person, like, I've never seen my mum be mean to anyone in her life. I've never seen her be rude to anyone. She's like, she grafted so hard for us, even before we met my stepdad. She tried everything. She was, she didn't have any qualifications. She managed to bag herself a job at a school. And she worked, she worked really hard looking after us on her own. My dad was out of the picture. My biological dad was completely out of the picture. We saw him like once, you know, Christmas and, you know, birthdays and that type of thing. And she's just supported us herself. So I know that she would have, for sure, if she would have known or had some sort of hint, she would have, she would have stopped it, I think. So I don't think she knew, but she recognised that things weren't normal, I would say. So there were certain instances where the sexual abuse had happened in the shower a lot. That's where it started, and I can get onto that. Um, 
where she'd stand outside and she'd knock and go, oh, is everything okay? And, you know, it just seems like there was some hint of maybe suspicion. Maybe her mind wouldn't go to that, but, yeah, that's how I'd answer that. I think maybe she thought things were unusual, but kind of just rolled with it. The thing is, as well, with... Obviously, she loved your stepdad. Mm -hmm. You always give your loved ones the benefit of the doubt. Exactly, You'll yeah. never try... You always try and focus on the positive rather than the negative. Yeah. So I can see exactly what how you've just said that. Yeah, and this guy was not, like... A normal guy like I can't exp he was a master manipulator and he groomed ev all everyone in the community um, to give some insight you know he, we met him at a local church when I was eight years old he started to build a relationship with my mom within I want to say six months we were moved in to his house wow yeah within six months we were is it just in. yourself or do you have siblings as well yeah uh, I have a sister called Megan so He's older yeah. or younger than you yeah older okay. yeah um and we were moved into this house and then they were married within a year. Yeah, so less than a year they were married. Wow. So he'd really swooped in and got himself wormed in with a family like that. That's a lot, isn't it? To go, to have yourself and your sister yeah. and your mum, for all of that to happen within 12 months. Yeah. That is a lot. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's like, I remember the first day we went to his house and being from a poorer background, he was sort of middle class. Um, and when I went in, I was like, whoa. Like I was just blown away with... You know, he had like a race car track and he had a, a summer house and a garage and a biggish house. And like, I'm running around it and I'm like, oh, this is going to be our home. Like, this is crazy. And he was so like, showed so much attention to me from early on. When we first met him, he spoke to me before he even spoke to my mum. So as I said, we started going to a local church where he went. And my first memory of him is, in, is him offering me biscuits, extra biscuits, because uh, after the service, they served drinks and biscuits. Um, and he offered me some, you know, extra ones, and I was like, oh, yeah, thank you. Um, and then the next thing I know, he's getting my mum's number, and then when we move in with him, all his attention's on me. He was, he'd do activities with me, he'd want to take me on days out, he'd want to help me with anything, and that's how the sexual abuse started. 